I love my country. I've been different places. I've been all over this country and seen most of it. I love it. I was born in Arkansas, and I love Arkansas. It's where all my ancestors are. And I'll say this, my son Matthew did uh, sort of our family history. He started with my dad, Milton Hoggard, his dad, Jesse Doyne Hoggard. Doyne, that's a funny name, but that was his name, Doyne. And he had brothers named Onus, Amor, Epom, Orton. Two sisters, Chloe and Floey, I think. There was about 12 of them, 13 of them, something like that. Huh? Yeah. He got Milton Don. He didn't got, yeah. My favorite one of those was Uncle Epom. He was the last one to, to survive. Um, he came to my dad's burial, and it was good to see him. He passed away a couple years after that. Uh, World War II veteran, Japanese islands, and uh, I loved him. He was, he was one of my favorite great uncles. But anyway, Matthew did the um, sort of, he went back, found out the Hoggards in England, it's Hogard. You have to be proper, Hogard. And believe it or not, there is a Matthew Hogard that is a world famous cricket player. And that's my son's name, Matthew Hoggard. So the Hoggards came from England, and it literally means hog garters, shepherds, like shepherds, only with hogs. And they settled in North Carolina. So there's a bunch of them in North Carolina. There's a John Hoggard High School, which I never knew about. And then they, some of the, they migrated to central Arkansas. And one of my ancestors, I got a picture, Matthew showed me a picture of him, from the, from the 1800s bought a farm, and owned slaves. Okay? Now, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have any say in what my great-great-great-grandpappy did. Okay? I had no say in that. So, what he did, God will judge him, God's already judged him. I don't owe an apology to anybody now, and I don't owe them any money. Okay? Um, about the only money I owe is on a credit card because we had to buy a new refrigerator, and we'll pay that off. But other than that, I don't, I don't owe that, and that's some of the stuff that's being brought up now is what happened in the past. The Bible says, forgetting those things that are behind. It is our history, and I think it's important to know it, important to learn from it, but you move on. Our country made mistakes, some of them pretty big, and some in our government are fixing to make a bigger one, okay? By choosing who's going to govern the country starting November. This is going to be, a, I've said it in January, this is a big year, and it's already proven that. There are a lot of decent American people in this country still. And they come in all races, they come from all backgrounds, and they're good as gold, and they love America, and they stand for America. But you have to understand, we've got external enemies and internal enemies. And our founding fathers knew this. When they said, anybody who swears and takes an oath of office, they do not swear an oath to protect the people. They swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And there are domestic enemies to our Constitution. And they want that destroyed. They have proven that. And I gave the evidence this morning. So now understand the spiritual aspect of this. Okay? Matthew 12, verse 25. If you got your Bibles open, it'd be great. If you mark your Bible, underline your Bible. 
And Jesus knew their thoughts. So if Jesus knew the thoughts of the people that were standing next to him, he's in heaven now. Do you think Jesus gets it now? What's going on? What's behind everything? He understands it. Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom, and this is what we're talking about, uh, Josiah, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If a husband and wife don't stand together, if they don't love one another, if they don't serve one another, benefit one another, what happens to that house? House is destroyed. It will not stand. That, so this Bible's right. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan, see, he was accused of being full of a devil and casting out other devils. And he said, and if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? Now, I used to read that and say that devils did not cast out other devils. I don't believe that anymore. I believe they do. I believe that in every pocket of evil, whether it's human or spiritual, or even in the animal kingdom, they will go after each other. What's happening in the Chaz zone in Seattle, what CNN is not showing you. They're not showing you the fighting that's going on every day and every night between the people that are there. They're fighting one another. And if left alone, if they didn't spread out from that little area, if left alone, they would eventually... Battle one another and destroy one another. This, our Savior is smart. He knows human nature. He designed it. He knows the wickedness of man and man's inclinations and man's lust. And so I do believe that there are people who have very powerful devils in them who cast out other devils. Why do I say that? That's the proof that Satan's kingdom will not stand. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. This Bible is more precious than gold and pearls and anything in this world. This Bible's right. You know human nature. You know us. There's not anything about us or our depravity that you're not aware of. Father, we thank you for the wisdom that you give us in the scriptures to know you promised us in Isaiah 33 that wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Stability. Father, we ask God for stability. We ask you for wisdom and knowledge so we understand what's happening in our world today. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Now turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, turn there, listen to what Jesus said, and then, and then think about it. Think about, ponder what he's saying, meditate on these things he says. They, I look for pictures from Google, now Google's not going to give you the truth either, but I look for pictures of the CHOP area, just do a Google search, type in Chaz or CHOP, Seattle, whatever, and one picture had a bunch of people sitting in the park going, hmm. Now, it looks like, so they did that to make it look like everybody's happy, everybody's at peace, everybody's loving one another, and it ain't true. It's not true. So look at what Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? Now, chaz or chop is a pile of kindling. And when you have a pile of brush, Sterling, what's the best thing to do with it? Burn it. Everybody that's got land does it. You get a pile of brush, cut down trees, cut up old sticks, pile them up, light them on fire. And chop and anarchy and antifa 
and all of these other leftist, socialist, communist, anarchist organizations, and there's dozens of them, they're the kindling. They don't know it. But they are being used and manipulated by very powerful people who want to destroy this country. Why? Because this country stands against globalism. Now, I say this country. I'd say a majority of Washington, D.C. politicians are globalists. Majority. And there are some that are not. And this country is the last... I told my cousin's husband yesterday, Jim, his name is Jim. I said, Jim, show me another country where you can own a pawn shop and sell guns out of it. Show me another country. He said, there ain't one. I said, no, there ain't. We had a guy, and if you remember, Sterling, we had a guy come and stay here a week. He was from Holland. And he was... He loved our ministry, wanted me to marry him and his wife. They already had a civil union in, in Europe. But they wanted a preacher to marry him, so I married him. And uh, we were talking about his countries from the Netherlands. And he owned a gun shop. It was one of about maybe a dozen in the whole country. And he said, if somebody comes in my house, robbing my house, beating on my wife, if I shoot them with one of my guns, they'll haul me away. You're a bad person. You're evil. You used a gun. You cannot do that. He said, I'll lose every gun I've got and lose my license to sell them. I said, this is the last place in the world. You can't do it in Canada. Can't do it in Mexico. Can't do it anywhere else. You can do it here. So look at what he said, verse 50. But I have a baptism to be baptized with. He's talking about the Holy Ghost and a fire baptism. I believe in that. The word Baphomet, Josiah, Baphomet, you know the, the devil looking thing? Baphomet means baptized by fire. That's what his name means, fire baptism. That's what he represents because he has a flame torch coming out of his head, okay? I have a baptism to be baptized with and how am I straight until it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, not yet. He will eventually because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he's the only one that can actually bring it. All other spirits bring chaos and war and confusion. And that's what's going on here. He said, I didn't come to give peace. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five and one house divided. Three against two and two against three. Notice that number five. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, mother-in-law against da her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I just described for you the Jerry Springer show. Amen? That's the Jerry Springer show right there. Children against families, mom and dad fighting one another. That's how it goes. Now, think about what he's saying when he said division. Because 2 Corinthians 6, Paul tells us, um, I better read it. 2 Corinthians 6, I know what it is, I just can't say it. Verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's a division. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Should we go into the chop zone, sing kumbaya with them and smoke their, smoke their dope and sit around and say, hey, we're all one people. Should we do that? No way. No way. Not on your life. I am totally against what they're doing. And I think they need to be shut down and jailed. They have stolen property, killed people, raped people, innocent people. They've taken over. So, uh, back here, verse uh, 15, What concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial is the devil. We know who Jesus is. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And, he, and all of these answers are no, there's none. It's a division. For he said, um, 
Uh, for ye are the temple of the living God, verse 16. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. He says that in Revelation 18. He says that in Jeremiah 51. Come out of Babylon. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Now, I will be a, remember what I said this morning. will be a father unto you and you should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God Jesus does bring division because, Jim, there's sinners in this world. I love them. I want to see them come to righteousness. But there's no way in the world I'm going to join with them. I am divided against them. I still love them. Want them to be right. But some people just are not ever going to change. It's like God seared their conscience with a hot iron and they're just fixed that way. And it's going to get worse, not better. It's going to get worse, not better. So understand that there has to be a division between us and them. The slogan that's being used now in social media is, this is not about Republican versus Democrat. This is about right versus wrong. What's right and what's wrong. We have a constitution that is supposed to aid and benefit every citizen in this country. They want to destroy that and replace it. Okay, now look at 1 Kings 11. Turn there. Let's look at the source of this division. 1 Kings 11. What is the source of the division that's happening in this country? Where, did it, where was it spawned? Remember uh, last week I showed you that the fruit has to be manifested. Okay? Well, who planted that seed? Where did it come from? The 12 tribes of Israel were all one people. They were brought through the wilderness, brought into the promised land, crossed the Jordan River, fought the war to gain the land. God blessed them. And they're now in Canaan land and they're all and God gave them each family, each tribe, their own separate possession of land. It was God given to them. And so they said, you know, live with your families, live with your tribes, enjoy one another. But even in one family. Sometimes we can't all live together. Amen. Even in one family. I love my mother and father-in-law. We have stayed in their house before when we first got married. But I was glad to get my own house. Amen. Glad. To, and he was glad for me to get my own house. Okay. So they're all happy nation. But 1 Kings 11. Let's read it. It came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem. Now, this is right after Solomon has died. Solomon's dead. His son, Rehoboam, or actually this is taking place before that, but it's setting it up. After Solomon died, Rehoboam became king. But remember, Rehoboam, the elders came to him and said, your father was a great man, but he taxed us too much. Will you reduce our taxes? Now you think about that. Everything's in the Bible for a reason. Amen? It's all prophetic. So Rehoboam, a young, young man, he's seeking counsel from the elders. The elders say, if you, they loved your father and they'll love you. If you lower their taxes, they'll serve you. They'll honor you. They will love you and they'll bless you. You'll be a very rich man. The younger guys that he had befriended came to him and said, I wouldn't do it. I'd tax them more. Double it. Triple it. Do whatever you want. You're the king. So who did he listen to? The younger crowd, those college kids. Antifa. That's who he listened to. That's who's doing this. There are not very many old people living in Chaz right now. It's young students who have been taught Marxism and communism, and they think it works, and their professors sent them out 
to make it work. So that's what's in their mind, okay? So that's what Rehoboam did. Now look at the setup. It came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him in the way. And he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces, tore it in 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take thee 10 pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father. Now, two reasons why God is going to... Split. He's going to have, there was a civil war with Israel. Ten nations broke off. They built a new capital, Samaria, built a new temple there. You remember they put the two golden calves there and they worshipped them. Okay? And then Ahab ended up being king over that. But Jeroboam was going to be the king of this new found Ten northern tribes, Israel. So it was Israel and Judah. Even though Judah and Benjamin were together, they was called the nation of Judah and then the nation of Israel. Now watch this. He says here in verse 33, the reason is they've forsaken me, have worshipped Ashtaroth, Chemosh, the god of Moabites, Milcom, the god of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father. That was reason number one. What was reason number two why that kingdom split? Does anybody know the answer? It goes back to David. David's adultery with Bathsheba. From Uriah the Hittite, who was on the list of Medal of Honor winners. In the Bible, there is a list called David's Mighty Men. There are 31 names on that list. Uriah the Hittite was on the bottom of that list. He was like a Medal of Honor winner for David. One of his best soldiers. His mighty men. And he had a wife, Bathsheba. Bathsheba was in Jerusalem and Uriah the Hittite was out fighting David's wars. And what did David do? Committed adultery with her, then brought Uriah home to cover up the pregnancy. When that didn't work, he sent Uriah the Hittite, his Medal of Honor winner. Do you think politicians even think about the boys that they send out to do their dirty work? David didn't, and David was one of the most godly kings that Israel ever had. And David cared nothing about Uriah, sending Uriah out to die. In fact, he told him, put him on the front line, make sure he's dead. And it happened. The baby died. A new child was born. But then the prophet, Nathan the prophet, came to David and said, Thus saith the Lord, The sword shall never depart from thine house. It started with David's adultery and murder. And God forgave him. But the sword never left his house. After that, his family was in shambles. You remember Amnon raped Tamar, his sister. Absalom then killed Amnon. Absalom then tried to overthrow David, his own father, even tossed him out for, for a time. Absalom ended up being hung and killed, cursed as anyone who hanged him from a tree, and Absalom got hung in a tree because his hair was long. And the sword continued. God allowed, and you know who Jeroboam was? A servant of Solomon, a slave. He was Solomon's slave and Jeroboam hated him and tried to kill him. Hated him. 
So this is why the prophet goes to Jeroboam and he gives him the 10 pieces of cloth and he said, you're going to have 10 tribes. And Jeroboam became the king of a divided country. And if you go through the list of every king of the 10 northern tribes, here's what it'll say. And -and so-and-so, when he was such and such years, became king and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Almost without exception. I I can't think of one who was king over the ten northern tribes that was decent. I can't think of one. There might be one in the list. But the majority of the kings of the ten northern tribes were all Baal worshippers and worse. And Manasseh was the worst of them. He was worse than Ahab. Okay? So you understand now how this division got started. In our country, it is the sin of our nation. Is God keeping track of the aborted babies? Is God keeping track of the wicked politicians? We were talking in the office about Anthony Weiner's laptop. Y'all know anything about y'all know anything about that? Anthony, they got it. Anthony Weiner, who got arrested for sending dirty pictures to a 15-year-old girl, the New York Police Department got a warrant for his phone and his laptop. They got the laptop. They found all of the emails that Hillary Clinton said were gone. They found them on his laptop, and there is a folder in his laptop called insurance, and it has dirty secrets. It was Anthony Weiner's insurance policy against ever going to prison he was going to use it against Hillary Clinton because there's something related to her that is in that laptop that General Flynn's lawyer made a speech about it and said there's something so evil in that laptop folder that it caused New York Police Department detectives to vomit it made them that sick And five of the police officers who were in charge of investigating that laptop are dead now. Suicide. Do you believe that? I don't. So evil politicians, God is watching and he is dividing this nation because of her sins. Sin's always the source of it. Turn to Ezekiel 5. And trust me, I trimmed down some of this message. There was a lot more in here. But I kind of trimmed it down a little bit. A little bit. I think it's good to know these things. I think it's good to know what's going on. I think it's good to read it in the Bible. Ezekiel 5 verse 1. And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife and take thee a barber's razor and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard. Can you imagine what I would look like if I took a razor and cut my own hair. I tried it once. I wore a hat for a week. And then he said, take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. Look look at what he said. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And Chaz is a siege. Is it not? And thou shalt take a third and smite it with a knife. And a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind. And I will draw out a sword after them. Thou also, thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. Then take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For is, for, for therefore shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. And do you think God is setting a fire in the midst of our nation. When they riot, what's the first thing they do? Burn stuff down. This Bible's right. It's the first thing they do is burn, they burn their own stores down. So there's an article come out the other day saying that there's neighborhoods now all over the country 
where the people who don't have cars, they used to walk to the store, walk to the pharmacy, walk to the gas station. Now they can't, they don't have any place to go to because they burn it all down. That's happening, and I believe it's going to continue. Now, turn, now look at verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, this is Jerusalem. Jerusalem's always a type of the church or churches. I've set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are around about her. And she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations and my statutes more than the countries that are around about her. For they have refused my judgments and my statutes and they have not walked in them. Did you know that there are nations in this world where sodomy is still illegal and punishable by imprisonment or death? And Kenya is one of them. They don't allow sodomites. Barack Obama went to Kenya with a big pile of money and said, I'll give you all this money if you'll rewrite your constitution and put sodomite marriage in your constitution. The president come out of Kenya, made a speech and said, bye-bye, Mr. Obama. We don't do that in Kenya. And compare that with America. And look at that verse again. She hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. There are things that are done legally in America that are worse than anything else in the world. Therefore, verse 7, thus saith the Lord God, because ye multiplied, uh, yeah, because ye multiplied more than the nations that are round about you and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, am against thee and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. I believe God could very well do that here. And I will do in thee that which I have not done and whereunto I will not do any more the like because of all thine abominations. Who, who, somebody told me there was Luciferians gathering. June 21st, is that tomorrow? Today? What's the day? It's, tw it's happening. Huh? Yeah, that's right. It is. It's summer solstice. That's right. I forgot about that. So that's what's going on. There's wicked all around us. Um, verse 8. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I even I am against thee, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like because of all thine abominations. Therefore the father shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the wind. What he's saying here is, I want to send a famine that's going to be so bad that people are going to eat their children, and vice versa, children are going to eat their own parents to survive. That's how bad it's going to get. And that happened. That happened. Wherefore, God said in verse 11, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things, that's a church, and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare thee, neither will I have pity. God, remember where judgment starts. House of God. Because... There are very few strong biblical churches left in this country. Thank you. I don't even know this guy. I like him. Because there are very few churches that are at least trying to be right and stand strong. That has, remember, we're supposed to be the salt of the earth and the light of, and the, light of the world. We're supposed to be the ones preserving this nation and giving this nation its savor. It was a Christian nation, was it not? When they started moving west and building towns, did they put mosques in? What did they build? Churches. All throughout the country. Okay? And now the churches have turned into corporations. We'll do what it takes to get the money. That's what we'll do. And so they stopped 
preaching against sin, stopped allowing or started allowing open fornication, open sodomy, the preachers being the worst of it. God said, I'm going to not spare my eye, neither will I have any pity. Verse 11. Surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare, neither will I have pity. Turn to 2 Timothy 3. Very quickly. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous, perilous means dangerous, very dangerous. So, my daughters carry guns. My wife carries a gun. Got men in this church sitting here right now. Roy's guarding your car with this one bullet we gave him. And I put a semi-automatic rifle next to my bed last night. You heard me, didn't you? I put a semi-automatic rifle next to my bed last night, or Friday night, and that bothered the daylights out of me. Why should I have to do that? When in my daddy's childhood, you left your doors and windows open all night. In my daddy's childhood, you left your doors and windows open. Now, I've got a semi-automatic rifle. Doors locked, bolted, alarms set by the doors. Somebody in this church wanted me to get them something to stick on their windows so that if somebody broke the window, an alarm would sound. Scary, isn't it? Perilous times shall come, for men should be lovers of their own selves. That's what socialism is about. Communism is about. It's about, I want what you have, but I don't want to earn it. And I'm going to make you give it to me. Men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, that goes with it. Boasters, proud, blasphemers. So they, sodomites hold up signs that say, if Jesus returns, kill him again. <laughs> blasphemers, disobedient to parents. That's, we should have seen it coming. When parents stopped Raising and training children to live right. Now the generation that was raised with no limits and no punishment now thinks they can take over a city without any consequences. As the twig is bent, the tree is inclined. That's an old statement. You bend a, a young sapling... And it'll be bent that way forever. And that's how the children are raised. Amen? Then they're, with they're blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. Yep. Unholy. Without natural affection. They shoot and kill, rape, steal from one another and have no common care. When that man, Friday, told me about his service to his country in... Vietnam, three tours of duty, Roy, three tours, meaning he probably got drafted the first time, but he re-enlisted twice to keep serving. And like I said, he probably grew up at a time when he had a right to be angry at how his people were treated. But he didn't hold it against his country. He stood for his country. And he was proud to wear his Navy hat. And when he told me a story, I just broke down and cried. That's natural affection. I don't know that man from Adam. But I would fight for him, fight next to him, stand in front of him to guard and protect him. I would do what it takes for him. Because he deserves the honor. That's natural affection. Now we're living in a world without natural affection. Truth breakers. False accusers. That's CNN. Incontinent. Somebody that knows medical terms, tell me what that means. It means you lose your stool. You poo your britches. Wet your pants. 
You have no control over it. That's what incontinent means. Now apply that to someone's character. That means they have absolutely no control mechanisms over their evil actions. Nothing stops them. And Antifa wants to get rid of all the prisons to let them all out. And these stupid governors let them out anyway. Because, well, they might catch COVID. Anyway, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. That's us. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, drugs, sex, alcohol, rioting, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away, he said. He's, that's division. He said, don't go around those people. Don't let your people run around those people. Jim, I'm so, I'm so proud of Charlie, I cannot stand myself. Jim and Cheryl raised Charlie. Little boy, I loved that boy. Nice young man. So they raised him to love his country. Now he's joined the army. Now got, Cheryl had a picture of him. He's sitting there holding his rifle. And I'm just going, ooh, I love that. You did good, Jim. You tell him we said thank you. Amen. Tell him we said thank you. But anyway, from such turn away. Jude chapter 1. Look at this. For there are certain men crept in unawares. So we have evil people inside our nation, inside our churches, in our denominations, in our seminaries, in our political schools. Evil people unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been infiltrated. Do you not understand? The communist did not attack us from outside. They knew they couldn't do it. Reagan made sure. The, strateg the um, Star Wars program was all about putting weapons in the highest place possible to be able to launch an attack on Russia or China or anybody else in a moment's notice. Instead of them flying up first and then going down, they just go down. And we can get them immediately. And that put a stop to the aggression that communism posed toward America. So they said, if we cannot get them from outside, we'll get them inside. China is funneling millions of dollars to colleges all over the country to have programs that, that are disguised as social programs, but they are communism fronts. Boy, I sound like, who was that guy? In the, yeah, Mac, Joseph McCarthy. It's the commies. It's the red kidness. Well, it is. Deuteronomy 28. Look at this. I'm going to end with this. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke. What is vexation? Okay. Vexation is, if I had a chalkboard up here, and I started running my nails across the chalkboard, how long y'all going to let me do that? Well, I'm going to keep doing it. Scrape, 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 scrape. I'm going to keep doing it until you do something about it. You understand me? Roy, look at Roy. Look at him. Crazy old coot back there. I guess he thinks that's his gun. <laughs> if I stood here scraping that chalkboard you, and do it continuously, it will cause a reaction out of you because if I don't stop and I'm not going to stop, you're either going to leave or make me stop, one or the other. That's what vexation is. You can't take it anymore. If I push Sterling, it'll make him mad. But he may not push back. So I'm going to fight him. I'm going to kill him. What am I going to do? I'm going to push him again. And if you don't fight back, I'm going to push him again. And if you don't fight back, I'm going to push him again until he starts something. He's either going to run or he's going to kill me. Or I'm going to kill him. One or the other. 
That's vexation. Do you understand that now? Do you see what God... Deuteronomy 28 is the covenant that God made. When George Washington took the oath of office, believed this, they handed him a Bible, and it was opened to Deuteronomy 28. He put his hand on Deuteronomy 28 because he knew what it said. It was the covenant that God made with the nation. He said, if you keep my statutes, my judgments, my laws, I'll bless your cities, I'll bless your field, I'll bless your going in, I'll bless your children, I'll bless this, I'll bless you, bless you, and make you above all the nations in the world, I'll bless you. But if you turn against my judgments, here's what I'm going to do. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing and vexation and rebuke and all that thou settest thine hand for to do. What did they do to us when this COVID thing come out? Everything that we did they put a stop to, didn't they? Until everybody got tired of it, right? That's vexation. You understand now? Until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. Numbers 33, 55, listen to this. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. God said, I will leave them there and they will scratch that chalkboard until you can't stand it anymore. And he said, I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm going to let them do it. Do you think that's what's going on now? Because what I read to you this morning says that they intend, and, and I didn't show you the speech that one of the Antifa leaders in Seattle said, in a, in a, she was in front of a camera, and she said, we are committed to this. We are not going to stop until we change or destroy everything in this country. Scratch, scratch, scratch. So God was talking about the people in the land that was causing them trouble. And God said, if you don't get rid of them, they're going to vex you. Now look at Isaiah 7. Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Now watch this. This is what's going on right here. To vex the nation. To bring a breach in. You know what a breach is? If you've got a wall, a perimeter set up, or anything like that, and... All of a sudden, the enemy comes in and puts a hole there or shoots the guys that are standing in the way or blows them up. Now they've got a breach in there. Now they can get in. Did they get in? Sure. Pelosi let them in. Schumer let them in. Obama let them in. Clinton let them in. In droves. Pouring in. I'm not a racist. My son-in-law's from Kenya. He came to this country legally. Hyunmi, Korean, came to this country legally. She's an American citizen. She has as much right to be here as anybody does. Okay? But they want him to come in illegally, vex the nation, which is happening, so that eventually our constitution is gone, and now there is a centralized form of government that has total control over everybody. That's the plan. Doubt it not. Ezekiel 32, I will also vex the hearts of many people when I shall bring thy destruction among the nations into the countries which thou hast not known. Habakkuk 2, 7, shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them. You know what that booties is? Not your butt. Sterling, it's all the money you got stored in the bank. It's your house. It's your property. It's your livelihood. They're coming after that. They're going to steal it all. When Obama told... Remember Joe the Plumber? Joe the Plumber asked Barack Obama, he's running for president, why are you wanting to take my money? And Obama was dead honest with him. He said, I believe when we share the wealth, it works better for everybody. And Joe the Plumber's going, it's my money. It don't belong to you. And it won't belong to you. Obama said, oh, yes, it will. I'm going to steal it. And they're going to vex this country enough so that a lot of Americans will give in to it out of fear. Out of fear. Do you believe in your country enough and do you believe in this Bible enough to die for it? 
I do. Live free or die. They will vex the country enough to steal and to take over. Um, Nehemiah 9, I'm almost done. Nehemiah 9, 27. Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vex them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. I listened. I don't remember who it was that said it before Trump took the stage last night in Tulsa. But somebody came out, if I'm remembering right, somebody said this yesterday. I'm thinking it was at the Trump rally before Trump came out. And they, they quoted... If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And God is saying to us now, if we'll cry out unto him, he'll give us, he'll save us out of the hand of our enemies. I believe, he, I, I believe God still saves, don't you? Herod stretched out his hand to vex the church. Why was he vexing the church? He wanted to destroy it. He wanted to destroy the church. So he killed James, then he arrested Peter and was going to kill Peter and do that to instill fear into the rest of the church people that if they continue being Christians, they will be killed. And you know what God's people did? They continued being God's people. When you kill God's people, it doesn't weaken them. It makes them stronger. The Bible's full of that. One more. 2 Peter 2. He delivered just Lot. Means Lot was justified in the eyes of God. God had forgiven Lot of all of his sins. But Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So pretend you guys live in O'Fallon. And Chaz set up an autonomous zone. I showed a picture this morning. There was a man in that autonomous zone in Seattle walking down street in a public area, buck naked. And he's fat. I mean, it wasn't like Schwarzenegger running down there naked. It was more like Tommy Boy walking through there naked. And a guy asked him, why are you doing this? Why are you, there's kids around here. He said, because I can. Now, if that, if that happened in front of y'all's house, and that man did that every day, walking by your house, flashing you, flashing your kids, your grandkids. You going to put up with it? You going to put up with it? Huh? With a nest of hornets. Lot had to deal with that every day. They were sodomizing one another in the streets. The sodomites were everywhere in Sodom and Lot was, it was vexing him. And when the angel said, we're getting out, Lot said, let's go. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust and the day of judgment to be punished. Trust God. Trust God, guys. Trust him. He's got a plan. And he's going to execute judgment. Make sure you are on God's side. Make sure. But in the meantime, it's going to get worse. 